<laughs> hey, everybody, she started. Okay, now can you hear me well? Okay. First of all, thank you for showing up. <laughs> thank you, seriously. Um, the reason we're here today is because I wrote a book, because I felt that there were some things that really needed to be said. So the book is Motorcycles, Madness, and Miracles, A Badass Journey to Empowerment. This book has many different levels to it, and some of them, it's, on the surface, it's a story. But then if you start going into it, then you start learning about all these references to things that will help people become more empowered. And then if you go into the end notes, then you're going to go even deeper for whatever it is you're searching for. So um, the talk today is going to touch on all those, and then the PowerPoint's going to be all the things that I found to be of most important in visual form. Okay? So we're going to start a little bit serious with the opening preface, but it won't stay serious. The Broken Ones. An infant lies in its own excrement in a crib. It ceased to cry. It ceased to care. A bottle placed in its hands like clockwork serves as its only nourishment. The child's mishappened head struggles to comprehend that it has been born into a world that appears to be barren except for food. No love, no nurturing, only actions that allow survival so that it may fulfill its role of being a living body to collect a welfare check. Time passes. The toddler is alone on the city streets. The fast pace and loud noises are exciting. This new world is tall, so the child uses its small size to remain unseen. Food can be found strewn about. Water is a bit more challenging, but the dark places keep it from evaporating. The shadows become a dear friend in the quest for life but shadows can't hide the boy forever. Authorities discover him and deposit him in an orphanage. Another front door opens, revealing a foster family within, the fifth one this month. The child walks in with a smile on his face, a mask of confidence. Meeting different children, he feels jealous that they belong. Some are so happy he wants to hurt them, but he tries his best to hide the anger, to play the game. Touching a plastic toy gives him something to hold on to, and that's better than nothing. But when they try to snatch your something, fighting skills are learned and manipulation is developed. Whispers become important. They teach the landscape of each new location. Not quite right. Worthless. A lost cause. Always feeling rejected, the mirror reflects anger. Another foster home is found. The flick of a nipple creates arousal, a curious new feeling that is pleasurable. Slowly, the child is initiated into the rituals of sex. The pain and surprise of penetration gives way to confusion. The perpetrator's eyes, lost in a trance, are no longer the seemingly safe haven they once were. An object is given to placate, to reward, and to thank for the silence that is demanded. A discovery of seeming purpose, which yields a room of his own, a clue to how this world operates. Secrets must be kept, but with them come a sense of belonging. The power to say no is stripped away, but there will be others who can replenish that which was stolen. Shame, guilt, an adult is, who is not a member of the game discovers the secret, and he is ripped away from those who have been satisfying the need for connection. The mind begins to spin. Thoughts, images, rejections, abuse, Faster and faster, the heat begins to radiate outward in waves. The mental turbulence becomes too much. The unreleased anguish has reached its peak. The child's mind is broken into fragments. That child was my foster brother. Um, I was adopted into the family when I was less than a week old. When I was two, he joined our family. He was four at the time. Um, he stayed with us for six years. And then he went into a mental institution where they, de they declared that he was a psychopath. Uh, they wanted to commit him. My mom said no, so he came back to the family. He ended up in Totemstown, the workhouse, prison. That, but that's his story. That's, this is my story now. So I grew up. Um, I isolated. I played guitar. I loved music. Then I found a best friend. And you know we were together. And I graduated high school joined the Navy, became an air traffic controller for seven years, 
got out of there, came back, drove cab. All of this is in the book, but I'm just skimming through that. And then a miracle happened. I was driving cab, and I was kind of partying too much. I knew I was partying out. And I was like, oh, I need a new career. And I kid you not, a voice out of nowhere said, auto body. I was like, whoa. <laughs> So I called up St. Paul College and asked them, do you have an auto body program? They're like, yes, it starts next week. Do you want to come down and register? I'm like, I guess I do. So that's how I ended up getting into custom painting motorcycles. So that's where we're going to start up again. I was taught that self-worth is based on accomplishments. So I proceeded accordingly and really pushed some excellent paint jobs through the door. This went on for a few years until someone mentioned that I was totally living the American dream. I was my own boss with low overhead. My days were my own, and I was an artist. I rode a custom painted bike that looked awesome. I must feel like I had it made. I was surprised when I heard this. It made me stop and really think about what he had said. And I realized though, even though I should have been happy, even though I had everything set up in a way that most people were en would envy, I wasn't happy at all. I, I was angry. I was drinking, having blackouts. My muscles ached at the end of the day. The food that I was eating wasn't nourishing, and I didn't care. So even though I was living the American dream, I was heading for a dead end. So time for a change. It had nothing to do with my career or home life, so I finally had to do it. I had to take a good look at myself and take inventory of who I was and how I went through the world each day. I was ready to find real happiness and know what it felt like to actually give a shit if I lived or died. So, the next 20 years I spent researching, experimenting, a lot of reading, learning about new age, alternative, traditional, all the different techniques out there, and I did my inner work. And this is what I've learned that I think is so cool and want to share. The keys to personal freedom. Health, control of my mind, holes have been healed, and self-sufficiency. Everybody's heard you are what you eat. It's, it's very, very true. The, the optimum for food is to grow your own, obviously. If you can't do that, a CSA is what I found to be the best, community-supported agriculture. And I do have a list of CSAs in the Twin Cities if anybody wants to snap a picture of something close to their home. Um, now, the way that we know this, energetic body is measured in megahertz, and then also um, looking to water, it's, you can, Dr. Emoto is a Japanese uh, researcher who took droplets of water, froze them, and magnified them with a, a very powerful magnifying uh, machine. And keeping in mind that humans are 60 to 80 percent water. Okay, I'm gonna read the left. Don't even try. Um, check out the right though. It's like your foods that you eat, like fresh food is in the 20 to 27 megahertz, where processed canned food is way down here. And then we'll get to this. Elementary science teaches us that everything vibrates, thus, everything has a frequency. This frequency has been measured with a VT3 frequency monitoring system created by Bruce Tanio of Tanio Technology. Some call this chi or life force, I'll refer to it as megahertz. So, this is what he discovered by measuring the different food particles that you're eating. And then Gary Young of Essential Oils, he heard about this equipment and he used it to measure his oils. Now, Oils, basically, they're the blood of the plant, the, the liquid, and they're highly concentrated. Basil down here at the bottom is 52 megahertz, where rose is up here at 320 megahertz. Yes? I actually have, she's talking about Gary Young, I actually have his rose oil with me. If you promise to smell it all night, because it's way over $200 a bottle. Yeah, and the reason for that is because they have to take all these rose petals, condense them down into just this tiny little bottle of liquid. So, hence the cost. Now this is where a human body is at baseline, 62 to 78 megahertz. This is when disease starts. In a report on psychological stress, individuals with a negative outlook, outlook were at greatest risk of developing colds, regardless of their intake of vitamin C and zinc, 
or their smoking and drinking habits. The next highest level were those who believed they were under stress. These people were nearly three times as likely to develop a cold, according to the report. Then they measured the people's frequency and found that negative thoughts lower the frequency by 12, positive thoughts raise it by 10, and prayer and meditation raises it by 15. Therefore, what we think has been scientifically proven to affect our body and our health. And as you know, out in the world right now, there's a lot of stressful things that are happening, but it's up to us where we would choose to put our focus. But what do you do when you have stress and you, you want to relieve that? Well, again, the essential oils, but then there's also, it's a product called Bach Flower Remedies. I'm on it right now. I also have essential oils on me. Um, and basically, it's made up of these um, roses, or not roses, uh, these flowers right here. And it really does work, and it can really lower your stress levels. And then they also have them very individualized. Like say somebody you know is close to suicide. They feel hopeless, they can't see a way out of it. This is one called gorse. You would give them some gorse and like underneath their tongue or you put it into their drinking water so they can sip on through the day. And it will change them so that they're able to start thinking in a little bit better way. And the, all this information is in the toolbox section of the book. But these really do work, I've used a lot of them and they shift the lens that you're seeing through into something higher. Now, this is going on to Dr. Emoto. Water is the mirror that has the ability to show us what we cannot see. It is a blueprint for our reality, which can change with a single positive thought. All it takes is faith if you're open to it. Some will call this pseudoscience, and they'll try to de debunk it because they try to debunk everything, but this is still what happens water molecule before you offer a prayer, water molecule after a prayer. You can see how one's just ugly and the other one turns into a beautiful crystal. They've taken uh, water from inside of uh, like cities, like the Twin Cities, and, well not necessarily ours, but you know from inside cities and basically the water is dead. So that taught me to start getting my water from a different source. I now drink spring water and then there's actually a way to make spring water into living water, but that involves taking spring water, putting it into a clay vessel for two hours, then in the shade for two hours, and then it's living. Basically, it's letting some bacteria grow, but it's good bacteria. And then here you can see, thank you, love and appreciation, but you make me sick, I will kill you. Now think about somebody being said to that as a child, and we're 60 to 80% water. That's going to change the entire structure of that child if they take that in and it's going to take it the change the structure of the person saying the words so that's why our words are and our thoughts are very important it's all our choices it's our, our our mind is our own personal choice and i had to change my mind so that i was in a state of hope so this is also from the book it's a conversation between katarina zora and groovy J, groovy J, and those are the two main characters mm -hmm. And Groovy J is asking me, well, how did I heal myself? Katerina answering, well, first of all, being an artist gave me the perfect opportunity for self-reflection. Picture me working alone in my shop behind the house year after year, sanding, painting, artwork, clearing, buffing, all activities that keep the hands busy but the mind free to wander. I noticed my mind was in continuous chatter mode and usually about negative subjects, which lowered my vibration and turned me into an angry person. But since I was alone, I couldn't blame my anger on anyone else, which is actually a good thing because it made me finally take responsibility for my own unhappiness. And since I owned it, that gave me the power to change it. So Groovy J is like, okay, well, this meditation, how do I do that? Katerina answers, rest the tip of your tongue on the roof of your mouth, which activates the chi or universal energy. Like this, he opens his mouth to let me see him. That's right. Now relax your jaw. Allow your mouth to rest in a slightly open, comfortable manner. Over the years, this has become my more normal mouth stance, which relieves tension and allows for easy breathing. Next, consciously focus on your breath. Inhalation and exhalation. I'd achieve silence for a few seconds, but then catch myself thinking about something I had heard or seen earlier in the day. 
mental noise. That's when I became proactive and turned off all external sources like TV, movie, radios, and video games. After that, it became easier to stay in silence because my brain wasn't trying to analyze the input from earlier. So I kept the outside noise turned off, and because I worked alone, I kept it quiet in the shop too. My circumstances gave me a unique opportunity to travel this path and see if it was worth it, and then report back, knowing not everyone has a situation like mine, like an Indian scout. Jay shares his own comparison. That's similar to when I'm 50 miles into a ride and I really settle into my machine and everything quiets down in my brain. So he's sharing how motorcycle riding is also a source of him of meditation. After you're done getting everything, you know, all the checklists gone and you're on the road and you're just going, then you settle into that, that zone. And same thing with artwork. So you start working on something in art and you get into it and suddenly time just passes and you're like, wow, that was cool. That's also a form of meditation. Some people do it with dance, you know, freeform dance. Um, there's lots of ways to do meditation. Anybody want to share some of their ways? Go ahead. Okay, cannabis. Uh, I know the Rastafarians consider that a path to atonement. Anybody else? Okay. <laughs> So the reasons why having control of your own mind. You discover your own truth versus borrowed knowledge. From the time we're little kids until graduating school, we're given everybody else's knowledge. When do we have time to figure out our own truths? This is when we do it. It's like, that's when I did it, when I would be in silence. And I would also do this technique of right hand, left hand uh, journaling. Since so much of my stuff happened when I was uh, just a little, little kid, <clears throat> I didn't know why I was angry about certain things, so I would write a question to myself with my right hand and let my left hand answer my answer. And at first it was kind of, you know, awkward and but it took the time and eventually I started getting answers. It's not like automatic writing, but it was coming from myself, from inside myself, and I just a word would come, and I'd write that, and then another and another, and before you I knew it. I was answering myself of what happened to make me feel the way that I was feeling at that instance. Now I'm very good with left hand cursive writing. Okay, so now a little bit of an um, introductory into chakras. Does anybody know what a chakra is? Okay, so a couple people. Basically, a wheel of energy where matter and consciousness meet. And this is from, like, comes from India a long time ago. Okay, this is not Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. <laughs> this is actually what it looks like scientifically when a beam of light hits a prism, it turns into a rainbow. And you, I'm sure some people have heard that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. Well, imagine this. Spiritual being coming into this earth, human experience. Now, ultraviolet rays down to the infrared, this is actually how the chart goes. They also correspond with all the different chakras in the body. I'm not, okay, not all the different, there's, we're just focusing on seven. Okay, so the root chakra, that's where we're, we're at our survival, um, our very basic needs. Um, how does somebody knock us off of our own basic needs? How does somebody like throw us off? Blocked by fear. They create fear. Second chakra, this is where um, we have pleasure, family, patience, uh, emotions. What is that blocked by? Guilt. Any Catholics? <laughs> okay, third chakra, willpower. This is, you know, how people say, oh, I, I just felt it, you know, I just, I go by my gut. That's willpower. And what's that blocked by? Shame. Now, there's actually a lot of energy that has to happen. There has to be introspection for you to jump into these upper levels if you've had, like, the trauma that I had because there's no other way to get into the heart. You, should, you close your heart down because it's a way to survive. So, getting into the heart, having an open heart, what that starts is you want to share, you want to 
to give selflessly, you want to be generous, um, you have compassion for other people and what they're going through, but it's blocked by grief. Hence the reasons for whenever grief hits us to truly cry, to release, um, to, to release the grief so that we don't end up closing our hearts instead. Fifth chakra. That's what I'm doing today, communication. And this is the first time I've ever done anything like this. <laughs> okay, so what shuts down the fifth chakra? Lies. Sixth chakra, that has to do when people start becoming psychic, when they can pick up on things. And that's blocked by illusion. And yes, marijuana and psychedelics can activate this area. Not always, it's, everybody's different, everybody's got a different body. And then there's the crown chakra. That's direct communication with the divine. That's the pineal gland. And it's also blocked by earthly attachment, attachments. But the pineal gland, and most people, when they're about 15, 16 years old, most of it's already calcified. And some, uh, most people believe that that is due to high fructose corn syrup and uh, fluoride. So, and then this is the chakras correlating to the spinal nerves. And if you notice, every, all these clusters are all in the same positioning. So there are some scientific proof to this as well. So basically, you can start just at basic survival, keep on improving yourself until you become a fully realized human being. So, growing up, why would I sometimes be feeling love and gratitude? And other times, oh my God, so much anger. I just hated this freaking world. Because everything that irritates us about others can lead to an understanding of ourselves. So I would use those opportunities to learn about myself. Why was this person pissing me off so bad? Oh, because I have that aspect within me. And because I had holes from my early learning. Oh, hey, I have aunts here. <laughs> okay, so holes. You got a hole in your gas tank, your gas is going to leak out. You're going to uh, run out, right? You got a hole in a human, you're going to feel drained all the time. Major holes. This is major trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, things like that. What happens is this major stress comes in there, and say it's happening to a child. The ch child can't figure out what's going on. It's just too much. And they can lose a part of their soul. Shaman, there are shamans that can reunite those parts. There's disassociation. That's where they just separate from what's happening. It's like, OK, I'm checking out. Uh, they can end up with split personalities, uh, fragmentation. All those things can happen. Um, and when it's a the trauma is actually happening, normal awareness is heightened. So that, um, so that all, everything that's happening at that very moment becomes fused together. So the location, the person, smells, what was happening at the time, the emotions that were being felt, feelings of being touched and where, even a song in the background become, can become part of the trigger. So then in present day awareness, say that song comes on the radio or something, that person's triggered right then, and they're going to they're going to shoot over to one of their coping mechanisms. It might be fighting, it might be freezing, acting, overreacting. They might just, I'm out of here, and basically, and then they're going to drop into a lower vibration. So then it's going to take time for them to raise that back up. So again, that's what happens with trauma. It can all be healed. How do we heal it? Nature. One hour in nature is enough to bring our vibration back up. Uh, in the book, The Ringing Cedars by Vladimir Megre, they talk about three days in natural setting with no electronic devices which restores us to proper thinking. Uh, we can do it ourselves with self-care. Reflexology is something that I would do all the time. Uh, basically, taking your feet and rubbing it. You find a sore spot, and you keep rubbing that, and that could be muscle memory that remembers where something that had happened, or it could actually be a toxin that's lodged in the body, like caffeine, nicotine, something like that. And when you're rubbing that spot, it starts to release it, and then it pushes it out. 
and then you have to remember to drink a lot of spring water to flush that out. Otherwise, that you know imperfection or that trauma or toxin can be lodged somewhere else in the body again. Smudging is another way. Um, smudging is taking sage that's been dried, you light it, blow it out, and you just rub the smoke over your body. And they do have scientific proof that smudging uh, clears the bacteria from a room. Um, let's see. This is what really helped me a lot. And this is kind of like the four directions of Native American spirituality. So my big thing was introspection, the west of the, uh, of the directions. When you do introspection, it will move you eastward to illumination, the eagle. And then when you're in the south, you, you start in trust and innocence, which brings you to wisdom. Once you receive a lot of wisdom, you want to bring back to innocence. Because the goal is to be in the center, in, in a balance between everything that you're doing throughout life. But that's why I painted my motorcycle out there the way that I did. Here we have the bear paws and the ego. Again, introspection leads to illumination, bringing me to the promised land, freedom. And once I reached a lot of wisdom, I didn't want to become an egomaniac or something, so I returned to, to innocence so that I can have trust in the divine world and trust that the world is safe again. Other ways that you can help are fitness, healthy habits, hydrotherapy, especially swimming in the ocean, not in chlorine, just because chlorine, again, is a toxin, uh, grounding, which is, can be visualizing roots growing from your feet into the earth, um, walking on the earth barefoot, or dancing, Reiki attunements or other energy healings, crystals, stones, the oils, um, reducing exposure to electromagnetic frequencies, um, and the, the purpose for doing all of this is to regain emotional connection to safe people, leaving that isolation that the trauma caused behind. When you have interactions with people, when you have a group of people that you love to be around, suddenly your life becomes more full. You know, where if you're going to always be hiding, trying to pre prevent yourself from being, you know, traumatized again or hurt by somebody, well, then your life isn't even being lived. By taking responsibility for one's spiritual awakening and transformation of self, you are directly impacting humanity's awakening. Your personal evolution is needed for the world to change. So, there are agendas. My brother, the psychopath, he always had an agenda. <laughs> and it was for his own good, of course. There are people in places of power that have their own agendas. But we can use it as an opportunity for change to go within and become empowered. Then you actually rise above where they are and they can't touch you. Direct communication, you'll always be warned ahead of time of things that are going to happen. It all works out. So as a recap, the keys to personal freedom, lifting the veil myself. That's what the word apocalypse means. Apocalypse in Greece means the lifting of a veil. Nature, again, three days with no electronics, you're going to be in proper thinking. Openness to new ideas, opening the heart and the chakras. Proaction, making sure you have good food, clean water. If you have, um, right now there's this movement going on over in England where they're making personal um, ponds. And the ponds are so clean with all these different, um, like, natural pond stuff, plants, that they can drink their water if they want to. And then also they are now coming out with atmospheric water generators that can take humidity from the air and bring it into a clean water source for you if for some reason you don't have access to another place. Self-sufficiency. Joining together with those people that you do know and like and working together here at, um, also at Breakaway, they've got a permaculture club starting. Permaculture is basically using all these different steps of food so that everything grows together. And he is he will come out to your place, set it up as a permaculture place for you, and then if there's too much food that you can't get rid of, they'll have somebody else take that to market, sell it for you, or you can trade or barter with other people. And suddenly, before you know it, you have your own community that's totally self-sufficient, 
If anything else goes on in the outside world, you're safe. You don't have to worry about where's my food coming from, where's anything coming from. And then there's forgiveness for those who haven't been able to reach into the higher levels because we don't know what their backstory is. We don't know why they're doing the things that they do. They probably think they have a good reason. So you just got to forgive them and just focus on the things that you want to have happen. So for the last thing, I'm, I'm going to read this last part from the book. Ruby Jay's um, ar oops, sorry. arguing a little bit. But there are things to be afraid of. Do you know George Orwell's book, 1984? In it, he talks about Big Brother and surveillance. There are cameras set up everywhere. Groovy J, when approaching a curve on your bike, where do you look? Through the curve to where I want to go. Why? Exactly. Don't focus on what you don't want. That's target fixation. If you want the cameras removed and have that ability, then fine, go for it. If you can't do anything about it, then look where it is you really want to go. Notice the things that make you happy. Expand them in your reality. Look upward. If you're unable to find true happiness, then heal whatever it is preventing it. We can't heal the world if we're out of balance. Even Einstein said, said we shall require a substantially new manner of thinking if mankind is to survive. I wanted not only to survive, but to thrive. So I buckled down and made a healing commitment, stayed on track, and guess what? It worked. Quieting my mind empowered me. Analyzing brought me clarity. And opening my heart once again brought joy into my life. If the heart isn't open, we stay in the lower levels and balance between survival, sex, and power. It's time to move up on the level playing field. Plus, the mind can never be as intelligent as the heart. Try to feel my words and ask yourself if they feel tree, true. We have everything we need within us to overcome every challenge that we face because it was put there in the very beginning by our Creator. We can pray for this healing and have it accomplished in a second, but only if we believe it is possible. If we don't believe in a higher power, then we can still accomplish complete healing by overcoming limitations within, which will then project as no limitations in our outer world. As far as those who oppose our healing choices, they will fade away. Justice comes from within. But, we, but it requires a fully functioning personal system, which we, through our choices, can attain. Jay quietly mulls over my words. I sense his dilemma at feeling powerless with the threats society currently faces. I also know that nothing I say will convince him to begin his inner journey. That's his decision. I only hope that all will consider self-exploration as a viable path. Thanks. <laughs>